All right, and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, as I've just made your comments in the box, in the chat box on the side there, and if you've got any questions, I will do my best to answer them as we go through the presentation. Um, but by all means, uh, if I don't get to them today, I hope to get back to the back to you uh, tomorrow uh, via email. So what we're talking about today is how to thrive in 2019. Um, and if you can stick around to the end of the presentation, I've actually got a summary that you can um, have as a PDF. So what I want to go through first is, once I get my cursor sorted, is why thriving is actually so difficult. This is probably something that most people talk to me about and what I see in my patients um, when we're actually discussing at the initial assessment why they're not living the life and the, having the quality of life that they actually like to. Um, and I think part of this is because of the limits that a lot of people place on themselves purely because they have been diagnosed with a degenerative condition. Um, so just having Parkinson's doesn't define you and it doesn't mean you've su suddenly got this glass ceiling over the top of you. Um, my patients have taught me this. Um, if anybody has given me a huge lesson, it has been my patients and what I've actually witnessed them achieving. So there's amazing stories of everyday living and climbing mountains and all sorts of things that I've seen. Um, it's just getting the model right. And that's what I want to talk about today. So let's just look a little, let's just talk a little bit about why you're having um, difficulties because with this background, we can put it into context then and talk about how we can actually overcome some of this. So. Um, one of the biggest problems um, with Parkinson's at the moment is that the diagnosis is actually made when the majority of those dopamine producing cells have already deteriorated. The problem with that obviously is that that leaves a very limited window of opportunity to create clinical change and reversal and improvement in your symptoms. So just looking at this diagram here, you can see at point B, if you can see my career, this is when most people will start to develop motor symptoms. So that might be the slowness of movement, the smallness of movements, the rigidity, the tremor, for instance. That's when you would typically take yourself off to the GP or the neurologist for diagnosis. Um, but it's at that point where you'll start to see that changes in uh, motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms start to impact on quality of life. So that's why there's a lot of research going into trying to detect biomarkers so that we can start to um, assist you long before the majority of those dopamine producing cells have deteriorated. But the, the loss of that dopamine and the dopamine deficiency in the system, it certainly impacts on the, the motor symptoms, but I think it's also the non-motor symptoms which can lead to apathy and depression, which also really impact on your capacity to, to be uh, self-initiate activity and, and physical activity. So one of the other big problems that we typically notice in many of the um, people that we deal with is, is people have become sedentary. Um, and this was a study that was published in 2013. Um, and there've been further supporting studies around this, just showing that um, on diagnosis, people with Parkinson's are already 30% less active and taking 30% fewer steps than their healthy age match control. And the concern with this is that although you may have Parkinson's, that doesn't make you Im um, immune to having a cardiovascular or a metabolic condition. Um, and then when there's multiple comorbidities factored into things, that really does impact on quality of life um, and ability to achieve and do the things that you'd like to do in your normally, normal everyday life. Um, this particular study supported that as well, looking at the role of physical activity and decline and sedentary behavior. Um, and looking at um, the progression of Parkinson's typically represents a lack of physical activity. So by the, by the time Parkinson's has progressed enough to be um, observable on both sides of the body, the, um, the auxiliary, people have typically declined about 13% in overall physical activity levels. And by the time um, people are starting to experience postural instability, physical activity levels have typically declined by about 21%. Um, so I think what's important to note here is that that's not inevitable. If we can, if we can slow the decline of um, progression of symptoms, that's when we can start to reduce the amount of physical decline, physical activity decline that we see in our patient population as well. And I think a really important consequence um, of Parkinson's because of this inactivity is it leads to this cycle of deconditioning and a worsening of the disability. And that's actually independent of the latent disease process 
itself. So, you know, if we can pull it apart a little bit, yes, there's a degenerative condition going on with Parkinson's, but the physical activity, that's actually independent on its own. That, that definitely can accelerate the symptom progression in Parkinson's. So if you are sedentary, just have a think now about how much time you're actually sitting down during the day, how much time you're actually active. And it wouldn't be a bad idea to actually document that over three days to get a bit of a record. Um, and then look to try and increase your incidental and scheduled activity um, on a daily basis. It's really important that you keep yourself active and moving. Um, and I'm going to go into a little bit more about how you can specifically look to tailor your exercise program as well. I thought I'd put this um, diagram up as well because this was a study published uh, late in 2018 and it was um, examining the difference between habitual exercises and sedentary um, subjects, people with Parkinson's, both groups. Um, and what they were able to show among many things was that the people that were habitual exercisers had a significantly reduced apathy score, um, which I think is really important because if you're genuinely indifferent to your situation, um, you're indifferent to doing an exercise program to improve yourself, then um, you're not going to achieve significant gains through an exercise based model. Um, so that was really encouraging to have a look at that and how um, much impact exercise can have. And then over on the next diagram here, you can see the BEP depression score um, showing again there was a significant difference between those that were, were habitual exercises versus those that were sedentary um, and a significantly reduced rate of depression in those that were exercising routinely. So again, it just goes to a very um, compelling argument for the role and support of exercise um, and more importantly, the... Um, the difficulties that may arise if you are sedentary in your daily activities. So if you've identified that you are sedentary or you're not active as much as you could be or there's ways that you can improve, let's have a chat now about what those options might be. So the first thing to put this uh, context, put exercise into context is neuroplasticity. Now, neuroplasticity, many of you will know. Um, some of you may not have heard of it before, but this is a lovely diagram, I think, that really explains what's going on with neuroplasticity in the brain. So over on the left-hand side, we've got this lush foliage over here in the green, and right over here on the right-hand side, you can see um, it's, it's shedding, it's pruning back, um, the leaves are falling off, um, there's not as much foliage, and that may represent the synaptic connections within the brain. What we typically see people that are sedentary is a pruning back of the synaptic connections within the brain. Basically, if the brain is not stimulated physically or mentally, cognitively, um, then the brain is very good at absorbing what it's not using. So it will actually start pruning back some of the synaptic connections. Whereas, so that's a maladaptive process and that's the double-edged sword of neuroplasticity. So being sedentary could particularly, could rep be re represented by this red uh, head over here in the tree, uh, whereas over on the green, that's where we would tend to see um, represented with somebody that is constantly challenging themselves with new and novel tasks, both physical and mental. Um, so that's what we're trying to achieve with neuroplasticity. And I think what's fantastic and what's new in the literature is that um, we now know that those synaptic connections can happen very quickly. Within minutes, we can have these little synapses looking to engage with other synapses. And once they latch on, um, we can start to strengthen those bonds. What's important to note is although those bonds start getting created within minutes, unless it's... Um, unless there's a reason for them to continue connecting, then that will certainly deteriorate uh, over the next couple of hours or days. So it's really important that you stick with a program and you do it routinely every single day in order to reinforce that connection between the two synapses. And if you find that those synaptic connections are uh, strengthening and becoming stronger and firing together, what will typically happen is more neurons to support synaptic connections within this same uh, pathway. So here in Sydney, if we think about going from uh, over the Harbour Bridge from one port, northern parts of Sydney to the southern parts of Sydney, we would typically go over the Harbour Bridge. And what happens if the Harbour Bridge is taken out is we will find an alternate road route to go from point A to point B. Now that alternate route will take a lot longer and it's a lot busy, like busier on a single lane highway, for instance. But if we kept using that highway and all the traffic was diverted that way, what would tend to happen is we'd end up with a two lane, a three lane, a four lane freeway. It may not be as efficient as going over the Harbour Bridge, for instance, but we certainly can see these reinforced um, opportunities to create and rewire and retrain 
uh, the pathways from getting from point A to point D and B. And that's certainly what we're starting to see um, in Parkinson's. And that's why we're starting to see such significant improvements in the exercise approach that we're um, applying um, now. So that gives you a little bit of understanding around neuroplasticity, but I just wanted to go one step further and discuss some further terminology. So here we've got neurodegenerative, um, which is typically describing when you're sedentary in your behavior model. So if you're sedentary, um, that is likely progressing your symptoms faster than if you were active. Neuroactive on the other side of the scale is if you're conducting a neuroplastic training model, which is where you're constantly challenging your brain with novel and new physical and cognitive tasks. Okay, so they're the two extremes and obviously what we're aiming for to give you that lush green foliage in your brain is a neuroactive exercise approach. Um, now, the only other definition I wanted to touch on here is what happens if you're neuropassive. So neuropassive describes if you're, you're a regular exerciser, but you're tending to walk the dog a couple of times a week, or even if you're running marathons, but you've been running marathons for a long time, you're no longer challenging the brain, creating new and novel ways for it to, to learn, essentially. That's when we consider your exercise to be neuropassive. And historically, physiotherapy has been neuropassive in Parkinson's because it has um, delivered a compensatory movement strategy or a cueing strategy that's all external and it's not actually um, really challenged a neuroplastic approach and challenged the brain to learn. So neuropassive exercise is great for general health and it's still a very important part of your exercise routine, but it will not change and rewire your brain. Um, so if you're not learning, you're not generally improving with your Parkinson's and it's not going to slow your Parkinson's down as much as a neuroactive exercise program would. All right, now neuroprotection is a bit of a hot topic at the moment. I'm just going to put a caveat on neuroprotection because it's not proven in humans yet. So as much as we'd like to think that exercise is neuroprotective and it will slow Parkinson's down, what we can see at the moment is a very compelling argument for it, but we haven't been able to prove it in human studies. So there's a reference down the bottom here, Frazita and colleagues, 2015. That was one of the first human-based studies that came out showing that um, people could be better off uh, 24 months after starting an intensive exercise program than they were when they started and on less medication versus a control group who continued on as business as usual. So what this um, what these two graphs here are showing, if I can orientate you to these, is the number of patients on monotherapy. So when people started this study, they were only placed on a MAO inhibitor, which was resagiline. And at the end of the 24 months, you can just see the progression here. This is the experimental group who were doing the intensive exercise. 75% um, sorry, 75% uh, of people were still on resagiline if they're in, in the experimental group versus only 20% uh, in the control group, which represents the number of people that had gone on to agonists or levodopa medication, etc. And looking over here at the um, UPDRS and motor scores, as I said before, people in the experimental group were significantly better at 24 months after the study than when they first started. So not only were they on uh, majority still on a MAO inhibitor, not levodopa, they were also better than when they started. And this was in um, significant contrast to the control group who were not doing the intensive exercise program. So this study was very exciting when it first was published. And there's been a few studies since then uh, representing something very similar which is why there is a very compelling and strong argument for the role of exercise in slowing Parkinson's down. Um, I wanted to put this epidemiological study up as well. Again, just supporting the trend of the literature that we're looking at at the moment. This was published in 2010 by Zhu and colleagues. And this was basically um, a huge epidemiological study that was conducted. There were about, from memory, 235,000 people that were surveyed in this study. Um, and then there was, some of the data was actually pulled out to create this um, publication. And they were looking at specifically changes of physical activities in relation to the risk of Parkinson's disease. So just a couple of things to highlight here. In the group that... Um, stated that their physical activity level in midlife, 35 to 39, was low and continued at a low level up until they conducted the survey, their risk of getting Parkinson's was significantly increased to the group that rated themselves as high intensity exercise in midlife and they sustained that through later life. And you can just see that 
here on the um, odds ratio over here. So this is a very positive effect and shows a reduced risk of getting Parkinson's disease. That's great because we can see the extremes there. But what's important to note, I think, is um, the people that rated themselves as high intensity exercise in midlife, but that dropped off uh, as, they, as they aged. And I think what this is really telling us is that you can't bank your exercise. If you've done a lot of exercise in midlife, that's not going to hold you in good stead. And we can see that by the fact that this odds ratio crosses the midline here. So it doesn't actually reduce your risk of getting Parkinson's just because you were very active in midlife. Um, now, the thing to note with epidemiological studies is this is not causal. So we don't know whether exercise stopped people getting Parkinson's at the point of when this survey was conducted or whether people were more active because they didn't have Parkinson's. We don't know. All we can see from data like this is the correlation between activity levels and risk of getting Parkinson's disease. But I think all of it plays very nicely into the compelling argument for the role and significant of ex significance of exercise um, as a management tool. Um, just wanted to highlight this here because I think this really nicely describes the, the revolution of how Parkinson's has been managed over the last few decades. So you'll see in orange there three um, time frames. The first one was in the 1960s, which was when levodopa was first introduced. So this really was groundbreaking for Parkinson's and essentially this stopped Parkinson's being a terminal condition and it meant that most people now live with Parkinson's and die with Parkinson's, but it won't kill you. And I think that was huge, um, but we haven't really moved on in medications from levodopa. That still remains the frontline defense. Um, the second revolution you can see in the 90s there, which was when deep brain stimulation was introduced. Now, as effective as it can be for some people, it still remains effective for only about 10 to 15% of the Parkinson's population for heaps of reasons. Um, so it's not available to everybody and there are quite significant uh, side effects associated with major neurosurgery as well. So it's not something to be taken lightly. But having said that, it still was a major revolution in the management of Parkinson's. What I really wanted to focus on was uh, in 2010, which is really where we started to see a huge uh, exponential explosion of all the literature available on neuroplasticity, pardon me, and neuroprotection, because I think this is really what we are now seeing as the third revolution in how Parkinson's is managed, because this has suddenly taken Parkinson's from, or your, your role in having Parkinson's as a passive passenger in the journey, to being incredibly active. This is your opportunity now, something that you can do for yourself. It's not just passively taking medication. This is your opportunity to get involved and really um, ensure you live well with Parkinson's and really thrive. And th these are the tools that we've now been given as therapists to support you in that, in that model. So touch point on medication. I think it's important to, to discuss this at this point in time. Um, as we know, currently, medication doesn't slow your Parkinson's down. There's lots of research and trials going into medication that may well do that in the future. But at the moment, there are lots of studies showing that the medication that you take, as effective as it is for symptomatic management, does not slow your Parkinson's down. So we consider medication not to be disease modifying. Likewise, with deep brain stimulation, it's symptomatic management, but it does not slow the destruction of those dopamine producing cells down. At the moment, exercise shows the only promise for slowing your Parkinson's down. And that, again, is why we can't emphasize enough the importance of exercise. So let me just have a look at this formula here because I think it's really nice to describe this as well. This is the formula that I think gives you the best quality of life and functional opportunities. So optimal medication dosage with your optimal exercise description what's you the quality of life and function so I'm really pro medication I think if you can't move as well as you need to and want to to function on an everyday basis you certainly won't be able to get a sufficient training effect and if you can't get a sufficient and significant training effect then you're not going to be able to slow your Parkinson's down either you're not going to be able to move as well as you should be able to and that in itself will not help you slowing your Parkinson's down so I think medication is really important it's important that you're at your 80% of the day, I think what, what most would be aiming for, and that you're reviewed um, regularly so that you are still on your optimal medication dosage. So that really is the formula that we support because I think that's what's gonna give you the best outcomes. The 
second thing that's going to give you the best outcome is helping to tailor your exercise program. This is a really interesting topic at the moment because there are subtypes of Parkinson's, but now there's actually a school of thought that thinks that there are actually things that are all coming together to create a syndrome of Parkinson's and they're actually independent diseases. Um, and we could certainly argue the case for bradykinesia and tremor dominance. They do have quite a different um, profile. They have a different, slightly different pathophysiology. And so that may well come um, to bear and actually be the case, but we don't know that at the moment. But certainly what we do know is that people do present very differently for many reasons with Parkinson's. Um, it'd be great if you think about what is the thing that bothers you the most about your Parkinson's. Is it the slowness and smallness of your movements or is it the tremor? Is that what you noticed first? Or is it that you're falling and freezing or having significant near misses? Um, because that in itself will help us to further tailor your exercise program um, and tailor how you will get the benefits and how we tease out the goals and implement and supplement them into your exercise program. So your type of Parkinson's is really important because it does affect the prescription of your exercise program. Um, so if you haven't done a quiz, there's actually a quiz on the PD Warrior website, pdwarrior.com forward slash quiz, and that will enable you to do the quiz and find out what type of Parkinson's you have. So let's just recap on the benefits of neuroactive exercise. So it really should get you in physical, peak physical and mental fitness. So it's not designed to give you an increase in your cardiovascular fitness necessarily. That's typically a really nice side effect, but that's not the point. The point is to increase your motor output, get you functional and get you into peak physical and mental endurance, fitness, motor output and function. Also, we want to improve your confidence. So we find a lot of people have had their confidence significantly shaken. You know, you might have um, thought about it yourself where you're just not comfortable going out at night anymore. You get quite anxious in a shopping center. If there's lots of people around you, you're pushing a trolley, there's kids, you're getting shopping off the aisles. There's lots of noise and confusion and that gets really stressful. That might be um, something that shakes your confidence or even to the point where you choose not to go out and participate in social events as much as you used to as well. Um, it certainly can help you to move, think and feel better. And I think that's obviously a huge benefit of an exercise based model. Um, and this model really is aiming to improve the impairments head on. So the impairments of bradykinesia, the rigidity and stiffness, the tremor, you know, we haven't really been able to tackle and deal with those previously. Our, our physiotherapy model was really designed um, for people in the Parkinson's and on a very compensatory um, basis. So we really never tackled those primary impairments head on. And that's not surprising that we never really got the improvements that we're starting to see now. Um, ultimately, we'd like to slow the gradient of your decline. We can't take your Parkinson's away, but if we can slow it down, I think that's got to be the next best thing at this point in time. Um, and overall, what we really want to do is, is help you and enable you to thrive in 2019 to really live the best life that you can. And I think it's possible. I see it all the time. I witness it frequently with our 10-week um, challenges. Um, it's amazing what people can achieve both on a day-to-day -day basis and also huge bucket list achievements. It's absolutely extraordinary. So I know it's, it's definitely possible. So our mantra here at PD Warrior and what we follow, let me just move this out of the way, is to be brave, to train brave and to live brave. And what that really means is to be brave first and that's for you to make the decision that you want to live your best life, that you want to commit to the process of learning how to, to live your best life. Um, that really is the first process. Uh, and if you're genuinely apathetic or indifferent, then this is not going to be a program that's really going to help you thrive. There'll be other people, um, psychiatrists, psychologists, or your GP that you need to talk to at this point in time because they're better placed to help you and get you ready to commit to a program like this. The Train Brave um, mantra is really about doing the 10-week challenge. That's our signature program. That is the program that will take you from zero to hero in 365 days. It sets you up with really good exercise routines, excellent exercise behaviors, helps you to understand the role of neuroplasticity and how to implement that into your everyday exercise program, how to get you back to doing the exercises that you really enjoy doing and might have given up or how to do them better. 
Um, I can't guarantee it'll improve your golf score, but it, you might have a crack at that. Um, but the train break model is really all around doing the 10 week challenge. And let me tell you, I've done one and I'm not looking forward to doing another one because it was the hardest thing I've ever done. But geez, I was in peak physical and mental fitness at the end of it. The third thing is what I think really stands PD Warrior apart and that's the Live Brave. And so the 10 week challenge is great, but literally you, that's not enough. You can't just do 10 weeks. It's about learning how to live well every day of the year. And that's why we created Tribe 365 because we really saw a gap where people did the 10 week challenge and then they dropped off, got complacent. They were doing so well. They thought, oh, I'll just have a little holiday and lo and behold, they start to deteriorate again. So we really wanted to create a model where we could support people, keep them accountable, keep you motivated, inspired, and really every day aiming to help you thrive and live your best life with Parkinson's. And I think that has been extraordinary what we've seen come out of Tribe 365. Um, so that really is our mantra and the process of helping you to thrive in 2019. So just a little bit more about what PD Warrior is. I just wanted to tell you about the four pillars because I think this is what really stands PD Warrior apart from any other program out there, any other recreational activity. Um, and this is what has really led to the success that we've seen in our patients. And we truly do judge our success through the success of our patients. And it, it's been extraordinary. I mean, this is the best thing I've ever done as a physio, hands down, because it's changed lives. And, you know, it's, it's so rewarding to be able to get up and know that a program I'm delivering is likely to help somebody so substantially in their life. So let me just take you through the four pillars. The first one is the neuroactive, neuroactive exercise program that we've just been talking about, incorporating neuroplastic training principles into your everyday exercise program, providing you with the education and resources so that you feel empowered, you feel confident, um, you build your own self-belief and self-efficacy. That is absolutely vital because that helps you to change your perspective on how you view yourself, how you define Parkinson's, whether you let Parkinson's define you or not. And it really removes that glass ceiling. And geez, that's so vital to helping you really thrive in 2019. So again, it's about perspective change that is derived through empowerment. The third thing is behavior change. So the 10 week challenge is basically set up to help you um, put those routines and habits into place and to get you back into activity that you stop doing or to really help you refine the activity that you are, that you were doing. Um, but it's about creating a lifestyle solution for you beyond the 10 week challenge. It's that 365 days of the year approach. That's really important. And again, this comes from, engineering your wins, discussing your wins, celebrating your wins, building the community around you, building all the resources around you. So that's why community is really important as well. And certainly what we've seen with PD Warrior, we are now uh, licensed in eight countries and in all eight countries, there's a community in each country. There's a community within each licensed facility. There's an online community. There's multiple online communities through PD Warrior. I mean, people just gravi gra gravitate together because they're all looking for um, like-minded people who want to be the best that they can be with their Parkinson's. It's incredibly inspiring to be surrounded by these people. So, you know, community is really, really important. It helps you and it helps other people and people just feed off that, that inspiration, that motivation, that camaraderie that we certainly see. So these really are the four pillars. It's not just about the exercise. That's totally missing the point. It's about all of these four pillars that make the program as successful as it is. So just to let, you know, recap on the vision and what we're actually hoping for PD Warrior is we really want to change the lives of those living with Parkinson's and we want to do that one rep at a time. So I guess my question to you is, are you next? If you haven't done the 10 week challenge, 2019 is your year. I can, I can guarantee it will be the best thing that you've done. And if it isn't, I want to hear about it and you can have your money back. All right. So satisfaction levels, just to back up what I'm saying, only 2% uh, of people thought that the Pity Warrior program wasn't worth their time. Uh, and this is typically people that are apathetic, indifferent, uh, generally not in a place in their time, in their life where they should be doing a program like Pity Warrior because it is very, very confronting and hard work. Um, satisfaction levels are typically extremely high. And what we... Um, uh, follow up is three months after the 10 week challenge, how many people are still continuing with some form of exercise and that is typically around the 94% mark. So we know it works. It does create 
longer term behavior change. Uh, we're yet to do a 12 month study on that. Um, and then this just gives you a little breakdown of what people actually do uh, in the exercise that they continue on with. So it's not about doing PD Warrior for the rest of your life. It's about choosing an exercise program that you really enjoy that's going to be sustainable for you and then pulling in the concepts of neuroplasticity and PD Warrior into that exercise program. Uh, if you've been to the blog, uh, you'll probably fam be familiar with some of these stories. But if you haven't, I really encourage you to go and have a look at our blog. It's called The Brave Blog. And this is where we like to showcase some of the amazing stories from the people that are part of the PD Worry community. So we've got some extraordinary achievements that people have, um, have achieved, goals that they've set and achieved, bucket list things that they've ticked off, um, you know, walking in snow up to thigh in Antarctica, um, climbing mountains, beating their mates up the toughest leg of the Tour de France, heaps of things. And then all the way down to the other end, which is the daily, daily activities, somebody be able to make the bed again for the first time in three years, fold the laundry, stay at work another 12 months. You know, it can be anything to anybody that's so, that's significant and something that we want to celebrate. So we're popping all of those in the Brave blog. So if you're looking for um, further inspiration or information about the type of people that commit to PD Worry, then by all means, go and have a look at the Brave blog. Um, but I guess the point is, it's your story. Um, and we want to help you write the next chapter because I really want to help you thrive in 2019 and I think this is the best vehicle to assist you in doing that. So let me tell you about how I think you can thrive in 2019 now that I've given you as much of the background information that I can. The 10 week challenge that I mentioned before, I honestly think if you haven't done the 10 week challenge or you have but it's been a couple of years ago, now is the time to rally and to go and visit your nearest licensed location. This will give you the ability to tailor your program specifically to you, to your type of Parkinson's, injury history, your goals, uh, your personal circumstances. You can have it all tailored face to face and I think that's going to give you some really good outcomes. Um, so check that web link out there um, and have a look for your nearest facility. Um, having said that, for some people, you're not going to be close to a facility because we're not everywhere yet. We're working hard on it, but we're not. Um, or you may choose that you want to do it independently um, and prefer online. In which case, let me tell you about the online version because this just relaunched in 2019. We sold out the first course in January. It's just going from strength to strength. The program is excellent. Um, I couldn't walk after the end of the filming, the four days of filming. So I know that you are going to be very, very fit um, by the end of the program. You're going to be in peak uh, capacity to function at the end of the program and it's going to be incredibly supportive. I can't believe the engagement that we're getting from our um, private Facebook group in the 10 week challenge already about how much they're supporting everybody, lifting them up when they're having a down day and celebrating the wins. I mean, this is what it's all about and this is what's going to give you the results. Um, so either way, whether you go to a facility or you do the online program, let me tell you what the 10 week challenge includes. So you've got two things. The 10 week challenge will give you 12 months of access to weekly exercise videos or you'll be going into your licensed facility to do your weekly exercise program circuit or one on one. Of course, you can go many times during the week. If you think that you do better with people encouraging you directly, then that may well be the model that you need to follow. Um, but many people are happy just going in once a week and then you need to be doing your daily exercises, which will be derived from the 10 week 10 core exercises and then the other exercises that are proving to be most challenging for you. So you can imagine and estimate it's around 20 minutes a day and then a one hour exercise video or circuit at least a couple of times um, during the week or a one hour circuit. Um, you get weekly educational content. As I said before, the more you know and understand the theory behind neuroplasticity, the role of exercise, um, the more likely you are to be engaged and to do this as a long term model. An approach. So we do provide weekly education webinars, not unlike this, um, and then people can come in and ask questions after that. So, you know, it's a really good forum to, to get up to speed with the content and the latest content. Obviously, weekly motivation either from your instructor directly, from the camaraderie of the group that you're in, um, or the private Facebook group. Um, and then group coaching. So this is where your coach instructor is giving you the coaching directly, or it'll be uh, in the private Facebook group. Um, and then we also give you access to the Tribe 365, which is really important, I think, in helping you to set yourself up for that longer term 
behavior model, being accountable and staying motivated. Um, we often have guest speakers and experts um, that we bring into the Tribe 365. It's an incredibly um, supportive community network. Again, if you're looking for, for buddies to hear what everybody else is doing, how they're dealing with common barriers and issues and obstacles, you know, they're, everybody's there to help you answer your questions. It's just fantastic. Um, daily q and I'm there. Um, a lot of my coaches are in there answering, answering questions and making sure that we're keeping you on track and keeping you accountable. And then, of course, discounts because everybody loves a freebie. So there's discounts in the Brave Shop as well for Tribe 365 members. So that's basically what the 10-week challenge gives you in an overview. Um, and, of course, there's lots of additional little features that we, um, that we talk about when you actually start the program. So if you're interested in the 10-week challenge, just hop on over to um, pdworry.com forward slash 10-week challenge and just put a little dash between the 10 week challenge and then you can check out the various different options, either find your nearest location or you can do the online version. So I just wanted to answer some of the questions that I often get answered or get asked, which is I already exercise regularly and that's great. And I think it comes back to the question that I was talking about before with neurodegenerative, neuroactive and what sits in the middle is neuropassive. So if you've been exercising and doing the same thing for a long time, or you go to the gym regularly, but it's considered neuropassive. You know, I can think of the example where you go to the gym and you sit on an exercise bike and read a magazine. That's going to be neuropassive and it's not specific to your Parkinson's and it's not going to slow your Parkinson's symptom progression down. So PD Worry has been designed specifically to slow your Parkinson's down, okay? It's different from regular exercise and that's why if you exercise regularly already, you are ahead of the game because you've already adopted good exercise behaviours, but it's very unlikely that it's going to be specific enough to slow your Parkinson's down. So that's why I'm saying, you know, keep doing your exercise, that's great, but let us help you refine your exercise that you're doing so that you really can get the, the most out of your exercise program and slow that Parkinson's down. Uh, for other people I have, look, I really want to, but I don't think I can. And that can be because of reasons of time. It can be I don't have the support, I don't have the motivation, I don't have any, re you know, whatever reason or I'm going on holidays or whatever. You really do need a clear run at it. So we would always recommend, and of course life happens and stuff pops up, but if you've got a clear run of 10 weeks, that would be the time to do it. And if you can't find the time, then it means it's not a priority for you and that's where we may need to help you with that. Um, you know, we think this is going to be the best thing for you and to really enable you to thrive in 2019. But you have to want to believe it too and want to do it. You know, I think it, the saying goes, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you really have to want to do this. Um, so it has to be a top priority. Uh, you have to make the time for it. And there may well be a, an, a financial commitment for you as well, depending on the model that you go on. But what I do know is that you can do this. You know, we've had people that are really unfit, very deconditioned, towards the later stages of Parkinson's achieve extraordinary things. We'll be there to hold your hand, whether it's face to face or online, you know, we don't leave anybody behind on the program. So everybody can do the program. Even if you've got uh, a comorbidity or something, if we can get a medical clearance, um, we can modify the program for everybody. Don't give me knees and back problems because we can work around all of that. We've seen it all. Okay. Um, sounds great, but what about the smoke and mirrors? There are none. I mean, we've tested this now on thousands of people all around the world. We've got over 2,100 2, health professionals trained up currently. Everybody is a believer in this approach and model. You know, you, as health professionals, we can't unlearn this stuff. It's completely changed the way that I treat, all my therapists treat. I can't look at anybody with Parkinson's and in fact anybody with neurological condition the same way because I know how effective this is. I know that you should expect to be better at the end of the 10 week challenge if you have idiopathic Parkinson's disease, not a uh, Parkinsonisms like MSA, PSP, vascular Parkinson's for instance. And if you do the program the way it's designed, you should be better at the end of the 10 week challenge and we should be able to help you slow your Parkinson's down. Okay, there's no smoke and mirrors. It's not a sales pitch. It just is a very, very effective program for idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Too old or had Parkinson's too long? No, no such thing. So we've had patients that are in the later stages of Parkinson's. What it, would, what it does mean and what I would say is that we'll take you longer and you'll have to work harder to achieve smaller gains. So it definitely makes a difference when you start the program, but it isn't too late. If you're in the later stages of Parkinson's, we can still help you. 
okay? And that might make the difference between you needing help to get into bed every day, to get on and off the bathroom, to, um, you know, stopping you from falling 15 times a day. We've seen that happen too. Um, but we do need to modify the program to be suitable, um, but it's not too late. So if that's the category that you fall into, let us know, give us a call, ask your questions, and we'll, we'll let you know, you know, whether we think it's suitable or not. And in an ideal scenario, this is where you would work with an instructor because they're going to be able to really tailor the program specifically to you. Um, but if that's not possible, then we can certainly look to do it online for you as well. And you've got this already. You know, I'm already doing heaps of exercise. I know all this stuff. You know, I've trained thousands of people now and I think I can put, I can, you know, count on one hand the number of people that I really couldn't help right at that point in time. There are very, very few people that would not benefit enormously from the PD Warrior program from the fact that if you're moving as well as you can now and we really can't identify any issues in your day-to-day -day life in how you balance, how you, what your coordination is like, your dual tasking, your scale of movement, your power, your tremor, uh, cognition, if we can't identify anything, then my argument is, well, that's fantastic. You've just been diagnosed. Let's keep you where you are for as long as we can and slow your decline right now. You are the perfect person to start this program. So really, there is nobody that wouldn't benefit from this program. It's just your appetite to commit, especially when things are going well. You might have just recently been diagnosed, started on medication, be feeling fantastic. I can guarantee there will be things that we can find to improve your life quite significantly. And I think the reason that is, is that Parkinson's is insidious. It's probably the motor symptoms are often there for a couple of years before you actually are diagnosed. And during that period of time, you compensate, you learn to change what you do. Um, and it's not until somebody really challenges you on that, that you realize all the things that you've changed and stopped doing. Um, and until you know that, you don't know how far things have changed. Um, and so that's why I would say that it's on one hand, I could name the number of people that we really couldn't help at this point in time. So I'm going to wrap up, but I just wanted to put this out there because I think you've got two choices. If you've listened this far, then hopefully I've provided a really compelling argument for the role of exercise. You know, I can't emphasize how important exercise is for managing your Parkinson's and managing it well. Um, I think this could be the difference between living the best life you possibly can with Parkinson's or, you know, remaining sedentary. Um, and that's when that neurodegenerative component really kicks in. So, you know, I'd love you to have a think. You, you're at the crossroads here. If you've made it this far into the webinar, you know a lot more than you did before. This is your opportunity to say, yep, yeah, this, is, this is my chance. This is what I'm going to do to be the best that I can do. And I, I, I swear you won't regret it. Um, you know, we've got a hugely satisfied, you know, high satisfaction rate. 98% of people think it's worthwhile. It's worth their time. It's worth their effort. It's worth the investment. You know, we know the numbers, we know the stats and you should expect to be better by the end of the 10 week challenge. So my question to you is, are you ready for your next adventure? You know, I've had people through the PD Warrior program turn to me and say at the end of the 10 week challenge that having Parkinson's has been the best thing that's ever happened to them. As crazy as that sounds, you know, they've said to me that it's enabled them to meet new people. It's given them a new perspective on life. It's given them new purpose. It's in some cases given them new opportunities for work. They've reprioritized their life and it's taken them in different directions. You know, I think if you're open to being the best that you can be, so much good can come your way. And that's what I think PD Warrior really has the power to do. Um, so it is about what's your next adventure, whatever that means to you. And I think that's what's so exciting to me and all the licensees that have taken PD Warrior on is how incredibly satisfying and rewarding it is for us to watch you and all of the people that we work with improve and increase the capacity for them to have a really, really good quality of life and to really thrive. So thanks for sticking around. I want you to just um, have a quick summary of what we've talked about today, which are essentially the 10 tips for thriving in 2019. There is a little link down there to where you can actually get this. So I'm just going to pop this over here in the uh, chat box here so you can, you can find it. Oops. I'll put it here in the chat box um, at the end so you can actually download that yourself. Um, and there's going to be a little survey at the end as well because I'm really interested to know whether this has been useful for you. Uh, 
sorry, while I'm chatting. There you go. Um, if it's been useful for you, if you're inspired, if you would want to um, um, pass this information on to other people and get them to have a look at the 10-week challenge as well, it's always great to have a buddy that's going through the same thing with you. Um, so if you are interested in the 10-week challenge, can I please strongly recommend that you have a look, check it out, see if it's the kind of thing that floats your boat. Um, because I want you to thrive in 2019 and this is my hot tip. I really think this is what's going to do it for you. So thank you so much for sticking around, for listening. Um, and if you've got any questions, I look forward to reading them. So thanks so much, everybody. That's just the link to the 10-week challenge. Excellent. Thank you so much. Bye now.